I'm not really a fan of keeping secrets. Make no mistake, I will happily keep secrets, but I'd much rather share things and then move on. There was a secret I knew about for nearly a year involving the fact that the Computer History Museum had gotten its hands on one of the holy grails, personal and in general, of computing history. In short, they had acquired the CompuServe archives. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Jeff Atwood, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. For some people, CompuServe is just a word, maybe a word new to them, while to others, depending on when they come into the computer experience, CompuServe reigns as an above-all declaration of an online world, either beyond reach or barely within it. For some people, CompuServe is just a word. If you bought any general computing magazine off of a newsstand, it was inevitable that you would run into one of the dozens of ads that they put in what seems like nearly every periodical that was available. Not only did these ads literally promise the moon and the stars, they were beautifully photographed, often with a science fiction theme, custom artwork, and indications that there was games, chat, and information well worth the price. Now, spoiler alert, it was not worth the price. CompuServe had a nationwide network that allowed you to use a local phone call from nearly everywhere, every state, often riding on top of MCI and Sprint dial-in networks to achieve this. But even if a phone bill was not your major cost, the actual per-hour cost of CompuServe could destroy you. It was no joke that using this service could cost you hundreds of dollars a month in 1980s dollars. It wasn't just a fee. It was an investment. And what did you get for your investment? Well, you got a lot of the things that we now think of as being free or just part of the landscape of being online. You had the ability to use credit cards to buy things that you read about on your computer. You were able to chat with multiple people about a subject well into the night. You could receive news stories that were happening that day from major sources, and you would also get stock and financial information that would have been hours or days later from any other source. Plus, you could get a CompuServe address in the 1980s that would function in every way like what we think of as email. Again, looking now, it just seems so obvious, so petty to even bring it up as something that's revolutionary. But for folks who were living in the early 1980s, the kind of services that CompuServe was offering to people seemed literally like science fiction worthy of their ads. For me, a kid in his teens with no income, the idea of getting onto CompuServe was beyond my reach, a dream that I could hope for that would never come true. Until people, and by people I mean teenagers, could figure out how to use CompuServe for free. Here's how that worked. CompuServe very quickly ran into the same problem that a lot of services run when they need to get more and more people signing on. Once the original, credulous, willing-to-spend-money-on-experiments crowd was gone through, you had to move to people who were skeptical, who needed to be shown that they could try it before they would buy it. So, CompuServe would provide you with ways to sign on for your membership, add your information, and then, after a short time, start charging you a membership pack in a computer store that would allow you to read up on it, sign in, give your credit card information, and then use it for a period of time at a discount before charging you by the hour. 
If a particular enterprising teenager went to a computer store, used some sort of letter opener to undo the shrink wrap on a CompuServe information pack, they could glance at the initial account name and password that would get you onto the system. They could then spread it among all of their friends from a whole variety, either sharing it over the phone or putting it on a bulletin board for everyone to see. Somebody would log in and put in fake information. Now, that sounds like it wouldn't work, but the ability of a service to determine whether or not a credit card was valid did not become instantaneous for a very, very long time. Instead, a company would do processing at the end of the day, or maybe the end of the week, find that the charges didn't work, and then go to the account and shut it down. But that was enough time for kids going on from account to account, downloading what they could, talking to the people they could, and then running into the night. In that situation, once or twice, I found myself on CompuServe for a short period of time, like putting on a used dinner jacket and cruising into an upscale club before somebody figured out that I wasn't anybody's kid and that I certainly hadn't given an accurate name to the doorman out front. And in those rare times that I found myself there, I discovered what a lot of people discovered. CompuServe was obscure. It was a bizarre interface of Go commands and a whole set of small mnemonic letters, meaning different programs and sections and games, and they would be added and removed over time like books in a library or movies on a streaming service. You could type go and a word and find yourself looking up encyclopedia articles or playing an adventure game or getting involved in space simulation or joining a chat from a famous titan of industry or a writer and looking around and buffering everything you could before either the system figured out what was up or you, very simply, ran out of time. I buffered what I could. It joined my other text files, and in fact, some of the text files on textfiles.com are very simply CompuServe messages and boards and information files that I had put on my desk when I was 13 or 14 years old. Over the years, CompuServe was joined by other online services like The Source, America Online, Prodigy, and I'll spare you the inevitable stories of CompuServe changing focus, getting bought out, getting bought out again, being turned into a brand, shutting down what it was about, and then disappearing into obscurity throughout the 2000s. Even by the 1990s, it was clear that CompuServe was on its way out. A short-lived attempt to rebrand itself as WOW fell flat. And over time, websites with just as good an experience as CompuServe were offering themselves up for free, which CompuServe could never hope to compete with. But for a lot of us, CompuServe stood in those opening dawning hours of general access to the online world as a giant, as an unassailable monument to all the potential that there could have been. I had scanned all sorts of CompuServe ads in, all sorts of things they mailed out, all of these beautifully shot photographs. But none of that could really equal knowing exactly what CompuServe was like, what its file contents were like, and all the rest of what was actually at the service. In the late 2000s, I spoke at a convention in Portland, and I mentioned that CompuServe and its history were one of my personal holy grails, that if anybody knew of a way to get access to those old materials, they would be resoundingly beloved. And after the talk, somebody came up and told me that there was a room, a mythical room, in Ohio, where all of this equipment and all of this old machinery and documentation from CompuServe was just sitting, doing nothing, being held just because nobody had thought to throw it out yet. 
And I would bring this up with people over the years, but nobody had specific details. But eventually, the keepers of this material contacted the Computer History Museum, and through many negotiations and processes, they were able to acquire a massive amount of the CompuServe archives. The full cataloging isn't finished yet, but a whole range of manuals were in that collection, and they quietly let me know that they had these items and would I be willing to see about them getting scanned. I'm sure I was saying yes before they even finished the question. So I find myself in possession at the archive with manuals for CompuServe something I thought we would never see, a holy grail that I was sure had descended into myth and memory. And when I make that pilgrimage, when I travel to see all of these items, it'll remind me that even when hope is extinguished, the chance, however small, of rescuing an important part of the history of online never quite goes out. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bighoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Manxalot, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Dileep Reddy, Trixie the Cat, Josiah Lusher, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt.